Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Leroy Hopkins. I'm a professor of German at Millersville University in Pennsylvania. I'm also a board member of the Black German Cultural Society and also a member of the Other Lernen Deutsch Committee. And I'm pleased to welcome you to our afternoon session. Our panelists are in place, so we can start. Uh, our first panelist is Vera Ingrid Grant, right here. She's the executive director of the W.E.B. Du Bois Institute for African and African American Research at Harvard, where she directs both the Fellows Program and the Rudenstein uh, Gallery. Uh, she completed her PhD in modern European history on transnational, still working, well, she's completing, she's working on, <laughs> and she will be done soon. Uh, our second panelist, you won't find her name in the, uh, in the list of presenters, so I'll give you some information, but I want to write this down. Deborah Abel, Harvard University undergraduate. Uh, she got her second degree at the University of California at San Francisco and did her residency at Johns Hopkins. She's on the board of the Du Bois Center, so there's a connection there. And she also joined, two years ago, the board of the New York Genealogical Society. Broke a barrier there, was a first. Uh, and uh, she has a very interesting story to tell. And our final presenter is Tina Camp, which, whom I don't need to introduce. Tina is our host. Uh, she uh, is the head, actually, of our committee that organized this conference, and I know she has a great deal to tell us. And this session is one of the reasons that I was glad to be involved, because for the past 30 years, I've been collecting information about black lives, both in this country and also in Germany. And our session, Telling Our Stories, Black German Life Writing. So, Hi, good afternoon. Can you all hear me? Great. I'm going to um, share some things today, and it's really a remarkable space to be in, um, this gathering of uh, black Germans, because it's uh, one of the spaces where I feel free to share some of these things. And um, just so to inspire me and give you a clue of why it may be hard is this quote from James Baldwin, Quote, all art is a kind of confession, more or less oblique. All artists, if they are to survive, are forced, at last, to tell the whole story, to vomit the anguish up. I've got good things to say, too. <laughs> it's just... <laughs> so, um, okay, so... These are my parents, uh, Lisa Lata Stega from Hamburg, um, and Olga Bernhardt Clendenin from St. Croix in the Virgin Islands. Um, they met in Germany after the war and got married and sailed off to the great United States of America. And I talked about, last year in the convention, I talked a little bit about their experience trying to get married in Germany um, and uh, what they went through. My mom, they tried to sterilize my mom and uh, the uh, army did various things to my dad. Um, but they were able to marry and um, slip off before the gates were completely closed to those marriages. Um, one thing I always remember, and my mom talking about bringing my uh, dad to, to meet her dad in Hamburg, um, was that my, my grandmother on my mother's side had left Nazi Germany. She um, didn't like the way my father was being uncooperative, and uh, they were losing standing in the community. So she went to the United States and joined the German community in Brooklyn, and, uh, but my grandfather got a mistress 
So when they went off to meet my grandfather, the mistress could not come, even though she was a, a, a valid part of our family for decades. She could not come because of her memories of the so-called black horror on the Rhine. This prevented her from even trying to meet my father as a member of the family. So uh, I'm just gonna go through these a, a little bit and then do some reading. This is my grandfather from uh, St. Croix in the Virgin Islands, um, Bernhard Gustav Clendenin. This is him in 1916 arriving in the United States as an alien. And this is my grandfather much later in life with his second wife. Our family seems to have multiple marriages. <laughs> and one of my uncles is married eight times, you know. <laughs> um, this is it with him with his second wife in the Bronx, New York. And he served uh, with the U.S. Army in World War I in France. And he was a laborer in, in Nantes. This is a picture of my older brothers and sisters in Amityville, Long Island, in the 1950s, uh, right before I came along. There are eight of us in my family of origin, and I'm number five, so these are my four older brothers and sisters and my parents. And this is the point, I think, where it's like a threshold because they're trying to hold on, but there's a lot going on that they're battling with. And our family kind of fell apart after this, right when I came along. <laughs> and um, this is the uh, ship, the U.S. Holbrook. And um, my father documented the experience of him and my mom in Germany and on to the United States, and there are so many beautiful pictures in their albums of the ship and their journey across the sea. Um, this article, a uh, slight article, talks about the Holbrook at the end here. The old Holbrook is known to thousands of soldiers and to thousands of GI brides and military dependents. The latter had been her, and then it goes on to talk about all of these GI coming back with the war brides, but they're not talking about the black soldiers. <laughs> but my parents slipped onto this ship. And uh, there's another slide of it. That's my dad, and this is part of their, uh, their honeymoon on the Terence. It's my mom. He's quite the photographer. That's their, all the ephemera. The novel I write this kind of includes these memoirs, but fictionalized a bit to take it easy on my family and sometimes myself, um, is drawn from looking at all of these ephemera, the photographs, the, the bits of paper, the ID papers, the writings, the diary notes, different things that I gather and, and then remake a new paper with it. So this is what I uh, call sand, where you know I gather these things, but then they slip through my fingers. So I'll just do a little bit of the reading now. One of the things I, I hope to share with you involves some negative consequences of racism and patrimony and classism on a very intimate level. I also speak to the experiences of being raised by my German mom, who was in some ways an ordinary German in the Third Reich, but she was also a technocrat or draftsman working for Grunman Industries and auxiliary aspects of their rocket program. Not the huge tunneled factories with their adjunct and infamous concentration camps, but one of hundreds of smaller factories that scurried further and further to the east as the war lingered on, along with their movable camps of slave laborers. This personal history of hers helped shape our relationship for better and for worse. Can you give me a five minute sense when I go in? Multiple beings emanate from our particular identity as black Germans, or in the case I present here, emanate from being raised in an intolerable household, that of an interracial marriage during the legal and overt white supremacy of the United States during the 50s and 60s. And in this case, my parents faced the newness of the immigration here from Germany and arrived here thinking that the worst was behind them. Their immediate experiences in post-war Germany as a black American soldier romancing a Freulein I spoke of 
their experiences in this forum last year. And today I wish to share with you some of the struggles they faced on their journey here in the United States. And because of their vulnerability in the social sphere led to some unspoken consequences for their children. Though I am one of 11, number five of eight in my immediate family, my father had an earlier family, another marriage. Uh, he had divorced uh, from his wife in St. Croix. Uh, which left him with an ex-wife and three daughters to provide for before he could provide for his new and rapidly growing interracial family. I also spoke of my relations with my half-sisters in my reading last year and some of the consequences and challenges of those relations. So what I'll speak of today comes from a chapter I call Ruby Road in my novel Paper Girl. And these experiences to live and to write are a little difficult, but I share them because there are elements there that may come from my experiences of being black German, or that I draw upon some of the wonderful aspects of being in this black German group in order to access those thoughts and memories. And they deal with child abuse and restitution and reconciliation and the forgiveness of perpetrators. And these words are not common to my other siblings. They are just mine. Maybe what I get as a gift in working through these things and sharing them is forging of connections with those who are othered and because of this experience give us a common link and paradoxically drawing me closer to you in this wonderful gathering because it's here that I feel most open and safe to share the story of Ruby Road. Morning thoughts for you, sometimes it's just a whisper while you drink your tea, a fleeting thought while putting on your shoe, a rising hope when you go to open a door, and these tiny flutters like hummingbird wings beating are messages from your heart. Listen to them. They may seem mundane or silly or improbable, but they are all pointing to something you desire for yourself. If you gather them, they paint a picture. And my ken, my tribe, or my beings, I feel as if they are a constellation of haunted trees and a gathering of sweet multiple mothers. And in paper, when I talk about paper, I talk about the handmade paper that you see on a gift or the paper in the typewriter or the vagrancy release papers, or the archival investigations I take, or the admission papers to Jack and Jill when you don't want to belong to that group, or the beatings, you know, the documentation of assault that my sister would file at NYU, or arresting the philosopher on a motorcycle, it's my brother, or kindergarten bus passes, or diaries, the diaries of my great-great-grandmother, Stega. You know, according to Henny Menkley, there was no such thing as meaningless violence. Every violent act has a meaning for the person who committed it. Only when you dared accept this truth could you hope to turn society in another direction. And it comes from the fifth woman. In Paper Girl, the protagonist's father gives her long lectures on racism taken from Ballybar and received to her as coming through a schizophrenic delusion there in the hospital room. Sometimes the protagonist is in Paris, is in a colonial space, riffing on the Mama Shelter New Boutique Hotel and the ghettos of Paris or reading Baldwin on the floor and Judith Butler in the cafe and she's wandering around in the road and in lightness. But it always comes back to the papers and even the ship papers, the slave ship papers and the Danish maps of Africa where my father would locate his land of St. Croix or the immigration papers out of Hamburg, the disease control hospital or just those papers on the German train, even on the U-Bahn. <laughs> Ausweisen. They have conflagrations in paper. And they are deep and thick, and I make origami sculpture with them, with an angry girl in the center, 
So it's paperwork at home, and paper is growing and overwhelm this, and saving paper, recycling paper, and paper skins, and skin is paper. The paper suitcase. My mutti walked with her suitcase made of cardboard, really. It's claimed a sturdiness invoked through its leather handle and its fastenings, and it's soaked through from an unfortunate drop more of rain would weaken it, but it's bolstered by its padded corners and general craftsmanship, and it became a weapon of sorts. This suitcase held her life, her photos, her underwear, an extra skirt, warm socks. Papers were in her inner jacket pocket, but the suitcase held all else. Heavy and unwieldy, she hefted it without complaint, and they walked for 50 miles or so, stopping for water, shelter beneath a tree here or there at night. And in this way, they made their way from Ockton to Eisenach and then further to Welkensee. Peterson carried his suitcase also along with the typewriter. This was not as manageable. In fact, it became their lodestone as if hung around their necks. And they worshiped that thing, that typewriter, and what it represented. And with the typewriter, they were technicians and bureaucrats. They were urban and white collar and superior and less animal. And they entered the countryside, walking through it, seeking refuge. They would find shelter and work, farm work, made to work in the fields, carry water and shell beans at night behind the watching, glittering eyes of the farmer's wife. When my Moody told me about her heroic escape to the West, escape from the approaching Russians, and shaming, the shaming she experienced at the farm, I sizzled, I really sizzled with the words that she explained this to me with. And the suitcase and the typewriter and these objects resonated with counter imagery that I came across in my work of the camps and the ceiling high piles of suitcases and bags emptied of their content alongside the jewelry and the clothing and the remnants of life stripped and hoarded and utilized. She was such a worker, Peterson too, their tale diminished and implausible as suffering in this light. And their pink was crimson to them, and this story fascinated and repulsed me all at the same time. So I'm going to um, two things that I want to talk about. I talk about it in the novel, and I won't have a chance to go into in depth here. But um, the two things that I think really get to the heart of what I, I, I try to kind of heal from and, and learn from have to do with uh, my relationship with my mom and my father's sickness. And um, his, uh, in that picture I showed you, my four older brothers and sisters, his descent into schizophrenia and uh, hospitalization and uh, how we dealt with that when he would return home and, and then go back to be hospitalized until he died. And uh, with my mother, um, we had such a tortured relationship that you know, she tried to uh, <laughs> end my life when I was 15. We had a great battle on the, on the stairs. And uh, you know, she came at me from behind with a kitchen knife. And uh, you know, that was a <laughs> great traumatizing moment in my life. And I tried to understand it and what was behind it and that rage. And it goes back to uh, experiences that I had in a nursery school and then my bonding with my father. So I was always at my father's side. I never left his side. Even when he was in the hospital, I would just go there day after day. And somehow that bond became um, very difficult for my mother to accept. So now I'll read a part from later on to finish up. I can tell you about the onion skins now, tissue thin and whisper soft crackles as you lift each one. There were over 400 sheets of it. She finally gave them to me one day. We were just sitting and being together, she and her Ethan Allen lounger, the walker close to her grasp in case she needed to get up. I'm on the sofa, TV blaring into her electronic speakers and set into that chair, winged back seat, her own private surround sound space. 
neighbors' battles resolved by that device, retirement home administration correspondence ended, no need to move again, her night excursions into TV land protected by adaptation. Do you want to try and do the videotaping again, I asked her. No, no, but get me some water and go get that box on the shelf. There in the back, that's when she offered me the onion skins. Behind the insurance papers, bring that to me. Bring that to me. Behind the fragrances of Chanel Number no. 5 and the mothballed silk blouses and tenderly hung rows of polyester elastic crinkled pants with matching soft t-shirts. Next to that and in the back and in the back came the manila envelopes with their sharp black markers noted on their Veterans Administration. Here, take this rusty file and placing it on her lap, she fumbles with the clasp and then she says, but put it back, put it back when you're finished. And I took it, I wasn't really sure what it was, not expecting anything really, but hours later I was still reading it. It was the military court-martial papers from my dad's trial, the details of his dishonorable discharge, the details of hell, the beginnings of eviction and foreclosure and ghetto life and resurgence, hospitalization and schizophrenia and homecomings and vagueness, wanderings, determination, and obsession. It was shocking, and yet it was good to see it in writing, the mundaneness of it, the doctor's commentary. You know, this Negro married a white German woman and brought her to the United States, and then going on, discuss his, discuss his psychological makeup. I must go down to the sea again, and that's where I go for healing, like here to write in the grill. Or here, where I found my mother's earlier boyfriend, he was a Nazi in the German Navy. She tucked his photo in between the pages of my parents' honeymoon album. <laughs> and that's a picture of my siblings and I, kind of in our fashion paper sailboats, and the fashioning of a flower on Ruby Road. Thank you. Good afternoon. I want to give you a sanitized version of growing up in LA, how I went from hell to Harvard. I'm going to leave out deaths, murder, gang violence, and drugs. I want you to know what it was like growing up in the 50s, 60s, and 70s in a biracial family. My story is really about becoming complete, becoming whole, and really finding me. I want you to look at these pictures as I tell my tale of survival. What did these pictures mean to some kid who was just trying to make it to 18? My story begins before my birth, 1947. It really involves a black man growing up in Philly, wanted to be an engineer, but his dad said black men don't become engineers, so we did what a lot of um, scientific black guys did. They went into music instead. He was um, a jazz musician, um, a, a, a boxer, and the, the way out of the ghetto, the way of progress for black men at that time was to join the army. And so he, like thousands of men, joined the army and he was shipped off to Germany. And then picture a young girl, 15 at the age, at the end of the war. Um, Bavarian, lived in a small town, our dwarf was so small, it was three blocks long. 
Um, very isolated. Education probably ended um, soon by 15 or maybe earlier than that. And these two people met, and they fell in love. And they became a couple. And from 1947 to 1953, my dad waited for permission to marry my mother. It took that long for the US government to give their OK. And most of the petitions at that time were denied. But I think that jazz, because he was a jazz musician, I think, and jazz musicians were the rock stars in Europe, the rock stars in Germany. I think that is maybe one of the reasons why they gave him permission. But I think he was the only one, or one of few, in 1953. So in 1953, they mo moved back to the US. Um, I was conceived there. I was born in Philly, but my brother, older brother and sister were um, born in Germany. My sister was not allowed to come over with us. She had a different father, so she had to stay alone in an orphanage, and she came across um, on a boat by herself at seven. She didn't speak any English at that time, and when she came into the Philadelphia school systems, you know, they weren't used to black kids speaking um, German, so she very quickly forgot it. So we lived with our grandparents, and, uh, you know, in a small little hovel, and my mother just loved being with her new black in-laws. She just fell in love. She loved the food, she loved the, the warmth, the laughter, all those things that seemed to be missing in her life in uh, Germany. So um, my dad continued on um, in the military. He was a jazz musician. He moved to Arizona. He played jazz with uh, um, Coltrane. Um, um, they were all at Fort Huachuca. But after 10 years in the military, he did what a lot of jazz musicians did. Um, he moved to LA. LA became the center of jazz. And so we resigned from the army. He was penniless. And we moved to a Mexican ghetto, a housing project, Mexican and black housing project. And within a year, I was about four, and about that time, my memory really came. I recognized that I was me at four. I remember bits and pieces of living in Arizona. I remember bits and pieces of, of uh, living in Philadelphia, but really memory came to me at four. So this was really my first place, this Mexican um, black ghetto, where there were gang fights and neighborhood fights and entire families would sort of fight, fight in between. But it was okay until my dad left. And he left, and my mother, the only white woman within miles was left in this very dangerous place. So the series of moves began. She felt unsafe there without my dad. She loved the people. She loved living with the Mexicans. She loved living with the blacks. But she felt unsafe. And we were far from relatives. We had no relatives. I, uh, I take that back. We, we had two aunts who were white, who had married GI uh, soldiers, um, who lived in San Francisco. They weren't prejudiced, but their cities were. So occasionally we would go up, my brother and I would go up to visit um, our aunts, but we had to pretend that we were something else. We had to pretend that we were a Filipino or anything else but black. My sister was too dark, and uh, she was not allowed to come. And the rules for those towns, which those towns are now entirely black, but the rules were blacks were not allowed on the, in the city proper, and, or you had to be out of town by six. 
So these were sundown towns in California. So one day I decided that I was going to tell some kid, no, I'm not Filipino. I'm black. I'm black and German. And I think that was the first time that I really felt this, I'm going to say what I am. I was never invited back to my aunt's house. Um, they still came to visit us once in a while, but for legal reasons, I couldn't go. Growing up in, in L.A., I just grew up in a sea of brown. I don't think I saw white people who weren't German. Everybody around me was black or brown, Mexican, Asian, um, but I didn't have a sense, I had a sense of security because these scary white Americans who, who might attack us weren't in our, um, weren't around. Um, and the only white people that I ever met were Germans. My mother's German girlfriends who also married black soldiers or blacks. So unlike some of the blacks, uh, black Germans that I've heard uh, from yesterday, um, I never felt that my color was anything other than what it should be. I never wanted to change the, the color of my skin. I did want to change my hair. You know, that was growing up in the, in the time where um, women used to iron their hair and straighten it, and if you had any curl, but that, that was the only part of me physically that I wanted to change. Um, and this is about the time that my mother started moving like a gypsy. We moved 10, 11 times. I went to 13 schools before I went to college. Um, so depending upon where we lived, I developed this sense of shame occasionally. When I lived in a Mexican neighborhood, I, I felt a little shame that my dad was black. When I lived in a black neighborhood initially, I felt a little shame that, that my mom was white. And I think that's a normal thing because kids want to feel like they're part of the group. And, um, but that soon passed when I was in my teens. So we moved out of this project that had gangs, fights, murders, drugs, but my sister went unscathed. She became part of the system. She, she really um, became a runaway. She became a heroin addict. She, she, this was the beginning of her downfall. Um, so what my mother decided to do was she decided she was going to keep us without any friends. We could only socialize with one kid, and that was her German girlfriend's children. So she would send us off to movies, which became my salvation. She saved enough money for us to go to Catholic school. Um, but we really moved so much that I can't remember having friends other than within our family, small type family unit. What was it like being biracial? What I say before the age of Obama when being mixed was so common. I, well, I knew I was black. That was a given. That it was like breathing air. You don't think about it. And I knew I was German because um, in my black brown environment, the only white people were German. I heard German all the time. My mother always talked to her girlfriends in German. But she was too lazy, I thought, to teach us. She even sent us to German movies where I couldn't understand anything, but just to give us a sense of what Germany was like. And German just seemed to be her secret code. I did meet a number of Germans who were also immigrants, and it made me really love that essence of being German. They came over with nothing. There was one woman who was a maid, and she said, I'm going to come to this country, and I'm going to amass amount of money, and I'm going to go back to Germany and be rich. She was a maid. 
She rode a bike. She cleaned houses, three houses a day. She saved $60,000 within a 10-year period, went back, and she's a multimillionaire. Other examples of Germans that, and I just thought, there's something special about being German. Just, <laughs> you know, they just sort of rise. You know, they're destroyed and then they rise again. Now, I heard a lot about the Catholic Church yesterday. And so this is the reason I changed my talk. I had written stuff, but I decided I was going to defend this church. And the only white people I came into contact who weren't German were priests and nuns. They were Irish. And I loved the Catholic Church. I, that was so different from the stories of growing up German. Because why did I love the Catholic Church? I think, well, one, I had this history of two aunts being nuns. But the Catholic Church was universal. You know, I, I read about the, the black people and brown people, where they colonized, where they, it was to me an eye opener about there were black people everywhere else. There were black people in Brazil, because the Catholics went there. There were black people in Africa, because the Catholics went there. There were black people in Asia, and it was just wonderful. In the public schools, there was nothing about black people. So I, and, and with all these moves here and there and everywhere, there was always a church that I could go to. And there was no color bar. It wasn't like the Baptist churches. I mean, I enjoyed going with my girlfriends to their churches sometimes. They still had to do mass. But the Catholic church, it wasn't segregated in California. They accepted us. They accepted everybody, and it was wonderful. Um, and they were, you know, they beat everybody equally. These nuns were just, <laughs> it was just, you know, the, there was the stick, the girls with long hair, they got beaten. You know, the people with dirty nails, they got beaten, but they, they cared. They just, <laughs> The other thing about being a Catholic is two things. Catholics never read the Bible. They just, the Catholics never read the Bible. Someone interpreted for them. So it was easy to be a Catholic. But we were given guardian angels. And I swear I sur survived because I had a guardian angel. I had some nuns, saints. You know, you prayed to the saints who prayed to God who helped you. But I had my own personal guardian angel. So when I saw all everything going around with my sister running around, running away, getting arrested, being raped, all these things, I said, guardian angel, what do I do? That's what the Catholic Church gave to me. That, that sense of stability in a really unstable world. What was it like growing up, seeing the world through the prism of a German white woman? Now remember, my dad I saw occasionally, but I saw it through a woman who was not only white, but who was German. So she didn't teach us about colorism. You know, she didn't think light skin was better than dark skin. We were all black. I mean, my mother gave me black dolls in the 50s and 60s. She gave me, she called me her chocolate baby, and she, and it was not derogatory. She loved black people, and she loved me. This is a woman who walked through Watts during the Watts riots, totally oblivious to the fact that she was white. And the neighborhood was totally oblivious that she was a German white woman. She was fearless. She loved, loved being black, a w German black. That's her name. She just thought that black people were happy, had joy, full of life, totally different from the Nazi German experience that she had. 
Now, my mother was a simple woman and uneducated, um, and she basically struggled to learn English with us. She was an immigrant, like my Mexican friends whose parents were illegal, most of them, you know, they learned English from us. But my mother, she would, you know, I would say Tochter instead of daughter. I would say, uh, you know, just sort of um, broken English German until the nun said, no, that's not how you say it. Um, and she never read to us, not a single story. She didn't know how to read English, not a fairy tale, no book. But she had photographs and she had stories and she had her own, I call them, grim fairy tales about growing up in Nazi Germany. And her history was my history. I just needed to know what made her tick, what made my parents so crazy, and how to survive this crazy period until I made it to 18 and, 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 and to survive. I wanted to know the good, the bad, and the ugly. I needed to know what was the Germany in me. Her stories were growing up on the farm and how they had a cute French prisoner of war that lived with their family because all, by, the, by the end of the 1940s, there were no German men in her village. They were all either dead or on the Russian front. So her stories are about being in the Hitler Youth, about being kept kidnapped by the gypsies when she was four and rescued by the Gestapo. She had stories about throwing potatoes over the wall of a local concentration camp and getting into trouble by the same Gestapo. About her brother who was a concentration co uh, camp guard and the pictures he secretly took. He went to South Africa immediately after the war about my two sisters, my, her two sisters who were Catholic nuns, who left the order to serve on the Russian front with the German Red Cross. As one aunt said, she, they traveled in those, those uh, cattle cars too. About being the black marketeer for her um, village and how much her village actually loved my dad he was their Schwarze GI, and they knew he was there when, he, when they were tilling the fields and they could hear the horn blowing because he went into the, the forest and started to play his, his horn, and they knew that my mother was going to get on her bike and ride around with all the coffee and all the illegal things, the things that you got from the PX. They loved my dad. They loved him for what he brought. So life became very chaotic in my later teens. My mother was too neurotic, and I couldn't stand the instability of all the moves. Why not with my dad? He wanted me to be a jazz musician. You know, that skipped me. I, yeah, I'm just not a musician, and I didn't want to play piano. I wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to go to Harvard or some other university. And I didn't want to turn out like my sister. So my last year of... Uh, school, right before that, I went back to the Catholic Church. I had lost my belief. You know, I still like being a Catholic, but I didn't believe the stories. But I begged a convent to take me in. So I went to the LA Orphanage, which was run by the Daughters of Charity, and I said, please save me. You know, I just loved the nuns. They were a wild bunch. They each had a dog, and they just were just a, a really wild bunch, this California type of uh, nun. Um, and I loved the support that they gave me, and they took me in. You know, the funny thing is, at that very, very orphanage, I meet my birthmate, who was born the same day, the same hospital, in Philadelphia 17 years before. How did we both wind up 17 years later meeting one another on our 17th birthday? That's another story. So 
At this point, I realized I just had to go to Germany. I had to find out what, what brought my parents together, what made them so crazy, what made them so verrucht. I went there. I discovered that there were a lot of true stories. My mother was abducted off the farm. OK, I'm almost finished. <laughs> off, off the farm. Um, I discovered a lot of things. I discovered that my parents were human, um, and I forgave them. And I was understanding, and I realized that parents are, you know, are, are human. But I also learned that I was black and German, and being biracial was just a wonderful thing. And the things that my father and mother gave me my dad used to say, life is tough all over. And I remember my mother said, you just make do. And so going to Germany for me was becoming complete. And I wouldn't choose. I would not negate the black. I would not negate the German. I am a black German. I am strong. I need to, to sort of contextualize this presentation because it's slightly different than the others. I resisted actually presenting at this conference and I was bullied into it by <laughs> Rosemary. Um, and I resisted it particularly for this panel because this panel is about life writing and I am not a black German um, and I do not speak in the voice of a black German, um, but I do try to write about black German lives and to tell stories. I try to do that, however, most recently. Um, previously through the stories they have told to me in oral histories, and more recently through the photographs that they have allowed me to look at. And so this piece comes from the larger book that I just published, um, and it's really about what stories photographs tell and how they tell stories of lives um, when you actually try to write to them as opposed to writing about them. Um, and I just realized that I do not have my glasses, so this is a farce. So I'm gonna... <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. You weren't gonna get very far without those. Okay. The title of this talk is um, uh, the motion of stillness. And that's this. Stasis, noun, an act or condition of standing or stopping, a state of static balance or equilibrium among various forces. Stillness, no, I'm sorry, stasis. Stillness, lack of movement, balance or equilibrium. What might it mean to understand the black German experience through an alternate take on the concept of stasis. Three boys triangulated among rubble, sculpture, or stone. A structure rises to tower above our trio in the background, yet diminutive they are not. Chins level and eyes trained directly on the camera, their poses project poise, propriety, and respectability. Below them, three siblings have multiplied into a family of six. A traditional family portrait, matriarch and patriarch with progeny aligned in front and the youngest babe in arm. The setting is once again stone, stark, unyielding, immobile, monumental. Stone is the canvas that links the palette of these images, stone and stillness. For the figures posed in each seem as immovable as, immovable as the fundament that serves as their backdrop. The proud African patriarch pictured here is Ekwe Ngando born in 1876 in Douala, Cameroon. He arrived in Germany in 1910 as part of an Ascari performance group that appeared in a spectacle staged in honor of Crown, the Crown Prince Wilhelm. His wife and the mother of his children was Ida Kleinfeld, born in 1885 in Silesia. We do not know where they met or the circumstances of that meeting 
or their engagement and future marriage, only that they met sometime between Ekwe's arrival in 1910 and the birth of their eldest son in 1912. We know as well that they were the parents of the four children posed in this portrait. The eldest, a son named Ekwin, born in 1912, their daughter, Erica, in 1915, and their two youngest sons, Mandenga, in 1917, and the baby, Manga, 1919. Do these photographs visualize stillness? Is there stillness defined by or as a lack of motion? What might we learn if we embrace the stillness of, this photo, of these photos as a form of stasis that is neither stagnation nor motionlessness, but instead a labored balancing of opposing forces and flows? It requires us to think of stasis as a kind of motion in suspension, a form of motion held in tension that actually animates stillness. It requires us to see this photo, these photos, as a performance of stillness that never quite achieves the cessation of movement. This is not a family in motion or on the move, though their infant's extremely prominent carriage is evident, evidence of a journey by foot to the staging of this portrait. This is a, a family structured around staying put. Their diasporic formation, while it certainly began in migration, is all about being in this particular place. These portraits are part of a visual archive of the black German experience that confronts us with the consequences of diaspora, not as movement, but as everyday acts of refusal. Refusal to capitulate to the status of an outsider. Refusal to be made invisible. There are acts of refusal that transform these family photographs into, com into complex accounts of fugitivity. The Ngando's photographic and diasporic stasis is a willful stilling aimed at achieving a complex and delicate balance and equilibrium. Their stasis is the act of diasporic dwelling, a kind of homeostasis. That is, an active and effortful practice of balancing multiple flows that produces motion, even in stillness. Homeostasis, noun, a state of equilibrium or tendency to reach equilibrium, either metabolically within a cell or organism, or socially and psychologically within an individual or a group. A balance in which internal change continuously compensates for external change to keep conditions relatively uniform. A lone soldier and two trios of military men Mandenga Ngando wears the uniform of the Reichsarbeitsdienst. Equin Ngando is dressed in that of the Wehrmacht, brothers clad in the uniforms of their fatherland. This very different set of images resonates eerily with those we've just viewed. These images offer powerful historical traces that record these individuals' membership in some of the central interest institutions of the Nazi military regime. Yet in photos like these, we see not only a German Wehrmacht soldier, but also a soldier sharing leisure time with friends. One shows a member of the Reichsarbeitsdienst on duty and in the company of other men in his unit. In, it is an image of a man in service, but also of a black man in the service of the Reich at a time and in a place where we are led to believe that non-Aryans and black Germans in particular were absent from the social landscape. Like all the images we have viewed, these photos present black Germans as integrated members of German society in a public sphere seemingly at ease with their presence partaking in these activities. A mother clutch clutches the arm of her son and pulls him in closely as a beam in front of the camera. Pictured in front of a railing against a verdant backdrop of trees, the soft rippling waters of a lake or pond and a rowboat tether just below project the placid rhythms on a day in the park. Stillness, stasis, or homeostasis. The image conveys le leisure time as respite in the midst of wartime turmoil and the enduring presence of daily life in spite of larger events. The military display depicted in these preceding images showing members of the Corps engaged in the duties of their, of their unit contrast yet coalesced with the less iconic, heroic, or ceremonious aspects of the life of a soldier. They are snapshots that differentiate themselves little from numerous others produced by other Germans, sorry, in this period. Most likely taken by other soldiers or the friends and family of those pictured here, these individuals' integration into the larger narrative of these uh, photographic practices 
makes race and non-Aryan heritage seem almost a forgotten detail. As part of a larger archive of black German vernacular photography, these are photographs taken with the intention of capturing a particular occasion and transforming it into an object of posterity. Each image clearly displays pride for a loved one in uniform and the respect and admiration that the uniform bestowed on its wearer and indirectly on the wearer's family and friends, even in a context where the uniform represented allegiance to a racial regime whose aim was the eradication of non-Aryans and non-Aryan Germans, including the very individuals who wore them in these photos. These photographs do not celebrate exceptional events or moments. They articulate instead the stuff of daily life, moments of relaxation, indulgence, or leisure, times when we feel most at ease, most comfortable, most ourselves. As photos of militarized masculinity, these images record their sitters' aspirations to the privileged status reserved for German military manliness. This affecting collection of images of black Germans in uniforms materialize race in ways that are inextricable from gendered embodiments of national belonging. They image Afro-German subjects who emerge in the trappings of nationalized masculinity. Yet it was a nationalist visuality premised on the concealment, the repression, and destruction of the very forms of racial difference, difference these images depict. The taking of this photo was motivated by an intention to connect and by a desire to image affiliation. It was made quite literally to invoke a connection and a relation. Each image stages military camaraderie as kinship in arms that the domestic photograph addresses to family and extended relations. These domestic depictions of soldiers as kin move us in a double sense. They stir emotional connection in us and they move us either toward a closer relation to the image or more towards a distanced estrangement based on the proximity that might have been, but must at all costs be avoided. The motion of stillness. Three boys pinned down in a fake gun battle, or perhaps Winnetou was a recent bedtime story, and this is instead a game of cowboys and Indians. Fanciful hats sit awkwardly on small heads, in one case completely unstable and falling forward off the kinky afro of a young Harry Davis, pictured far left. Lying on their stomachs on a cobblestone courtyard, they flatten themselves to the ground, seeking cover from imaginary incoming fire. Smiling ear to ear, arms and guns extended, they are fully in character, dodging bullets and firing back to the audible bang bang of a fantasy shootout. Bang bang of a different sort. The clash of 10 six sticks on five snare drums, a children's band, Fife and Drum Corps, circa 1935. A line of boys alter alternating right to left, drum, flute, drum, flute, drum. The alternating pattern ends left of the band leader, where the smallest three members of the group jumble together in disarray. Out in front, third from the left, stands Harry Davis, dressed in a pristine sailor suit with the drum at waist. A marching band in full regalia. Was their performance imminent, or had it just ended moments ago? perhaps a local parade in celebration of spring. On a sunny day like this in the village of Hudasdorf, the whole town might be assembled. Parents, friends, and neighbors, this band was the embodiment of belonging. No banging, and certainly no music. Quite possibly an awful lot of fidgeting, but an utter lack of movement was certainly the goal. Mission seemingly accomplished. 26 tamed and docile boys assemble in a group photo under the watchful eye of a school teacher. Towering over them center frame, he gazes off into the distance. Looking away with a sense of satisfaction on his face, he seems proud of his supreme accomplishment, successfully corralling a group of two dozen little boys. Bony knees crossed, sailor suits and suspenders, offset ears, and front row far left, a curiously formal trench coat adorned this motley crew and the smallest among them stands forth from the right, Harry Davis, I'm sorry, the tallest among them, Harry Davis once again, impeccable and well-kempt, sporting what today would count as a perfectly formed flat top fro. <laughs> a boy at play with friends, with toy guns on the ground or making music in a marching band, what unites these photos is the continuity of groups. Each photograph stills a moment of group activity scenes of children in school or at play. When we view these images together, what do we see? 
They visualize boyhood through a tableau composed of group constellations that structure the social milieu of a child, a trio of friends, a primary school class, a marching band, images that typify a life entangled in the social networks of everyday life. Harry Davis was born in 1921 in Kalkberge, the son of John Davis, a Liberian migrant to Germany, and Hedwig Davis, um, his wife. John and Agnes Davis settled in Rudersdorf just outside Berlin in the late teens or early 1920s, where John Davis supported his family through a variety of positions, including minor roles in the fledgling colonial propaganda film industry that developed in the desert-like uh, setting of, sand of sandstone mining industries uh, based in Rudersdorf, and as an employee of the shoe shop shown in this photograph at the right. While these images figure familiar scenes of family stability and diasporic dwelling, they also enact subtle forms of fugitivity through their ability to visualize a recalcitrant normalcy in the places and the settings where it should not be, and to display survival not in heroic or spectacular acts, but through participation in the mundane events of everyday life. They do so through depictions of domesticity and dwelling that manifest profound statements of refusal through their defiant insistence on the intimacy and protection of home and the, famili and, and the familial embrace. Their stasis is, again, a homeostasis that is not stopping motion, but effortlessly balancing and coordinating forces of motion in stillness. Indeed, we might think of homeostasis as one important way of understanding the forms of diasporic homemaking we see figured in this archive of images. For the complex practices of dwelling and creating families and homes that characterize the black German experience require acts of balancing and coordination that allow these individuals to claim the status of German subjects and simultaneously to articulate equally complex forms of fugitivity as Germans of African descent. Homeostasis and the fugitivity of home. Rudersdorf by Berlin, circa 1937. Several years later, another trio of friends congeals, lounging together on a couch in a living room. At home, both literally and figuratively, they rest reassured in the presence of one another and in the collectivity formed through that presence. Beer bottles and glasses, half empty or half full, adorn a side table. These vessels betray the progression of the evening like an hourglass marking the passage of time. These three have had a few and they aren't finished yet. Slouched uh, together on a sofa, cigarettes in mouth, mid-drag or mid-sentence, the inhale of the brown-skinned young man far to the left, Harry Davis, once again, is suspended in perpetuity. The body language it captures is familiar, if not familial. It emotes and connotes comfort, intimacy, and proximity. These are friends who are both at home and at home with each other, what other men would practically cuddle together on the couch. <laughs> Rudolf circa 1938. In another trio, in a markedly different setting with a markedly different sensibility, its venue is a workplace, a farm with livestock quite literally in hand. Rather than conversation, work is in progress. The shearing of sheep, its physical labor momentarily paused. Tufts, bunches, piles and piles of wood permeate the image in the background, in the foreground, underfoot and in hand. Soft and fuzzy, wild and unruly, it adds texture, tactility and contrast to the image. It is a texture that seems at odds with the photograph's laconic subjects. The image itself is equally fuzzy, with the figures at the right and the left slightly out of focus but its subjects are certainly not focused, and certainly not fuzzy, anything but. They're rugged individuals, working men, posed with purpose and intent. Was it warm or cold on this particular workday? The answer is unclear, though judging from the layers of clothes worn by the youthful figure to the right, it is unlikely that it was the height of summer. A diminutive lamb rests in its head at the waist of the center figure. Its shearer strikes a commanding figure pose, posed with, uh, with an electric razor in hand and one leg raised, supported by the plank on which the livestock rests. Contrary to his authoritative stance, he, like his colleague to the right, is merely an apprentice. Their teacher, or Schermeister, at the left of the image, stares in half profile directly at the camera. To the right of the frame, his black German apprentice, Harry Davis, cradles the next in the shearing queue. 
a black sheep. Was the irony of this shot intentionally staged or serendipitous? Was its composition a prank or a lighthearted joke? Or did it go completely unnoticed by the photographer and his subjects? Perhaps it was a detail that seemed as unimportant as another overlooked feature in this photo, a beer bottle perched innocently and remotely, yet all too prominently nevertheless, on a ledge on the upper left corner of the frame. Was the black sheep an analog that visualized the unspoken but unavoidable contrast in this image, the loud silence of racial difference? Does it stand in for the obvious, that which, both, uh, that which need not and perhaps should not be stated, possibly, but perhaps we should read it a bit less cynically and a bit less allegorically? In the tight proximity of this workspace, there is either intimacy or animosity. In this photo, presence indicates belonging, for you would not and perhaps could not be there if you did not belong. A common task, a common space, a common masculinity performed in the collectivity of work. Similar to the military enterprise that solidified the Ngando brothers in arms, this display of masculinity in labor renders these individuals one in work. But while racial difference may here seem repressed, it was certainly not irrelevant. Like the visual contrast of the black sheep in this photo, it too could neither be erased nor overlooked. These images of Harry Davis were taken sometime between 1935 and 1939, while he was living as an apprentice on a Pachthof or lease farm dubbed Grunelinde, operated by Wilhelm Thome on the outskirts of Rostov. They are part of a larger archive of family photos that show Davis from childhood to early adulthood at play or at rest with friends, engaged in the tasks of his workday, shearing sheep and driving a tractor, or assembled at communal gatherings of friends and colleagues. As a series, they chronicle happy times and moments of leisure at different periods in its life. And as the archivists of this collection noted, images like these depict the place of acceptance Davis enjoyed at the time as one of several apprentices who inhabited a marginal position in the eyes of the Nazi regime. In addition to Davis's presence as a black German apprentice, Tomei also sheltered and employed two other workers, one of Jewish heritage and one a communist uh, activist, who he sheltered on the basis of his anti-Nazi convictions. Um, this image, this image, here, <laughs> this image could have been the postscript to the previous image or the prequel to the couch scene pictured in the photo that opened this particular section. Perhaps the day that ended draped on a couch in a parlor began earlier, standing in the sunshine outside a local pub. A send-off for a buddy conscripted to serve, a toast to welcome him briefly home, or possibly a chance encounter or temporary companionship forged through beer. Photographed against a backdrop of foliage hanging from what, dangling from what appears to be a balcony or window box, the proximity of this jovial group of five is as striking in its physicality as the previous image in this series. Far right, a young man seems to tug on the lapel of his friend, Harry Davis, who pres whose presence constitutes the series of images as a set. Second from left, the most ebullient of the five beams widely, glass in hand, and poised to sip. Far left, next to him, a fifth member completes the group. Dressed in a uniform, he is a member of a military group we cannot identify from this vantage point. Luftwaffe, Reichsarbeitsdienst, or Wehrmacht. Whether domestic security or deployed for conquest abroad, his casual presence in this configuration attests to the ubiquity of the military in everyday life, for the Third Reich was a thoroughly militarized society where uniforms were a visual norm in the beer garden as well as on the battlefield. What do we learn by reading these three images together? In fact, their significance emerges only when we read them together in relation to one another and in the spaces between them. Together, the story they tell is that Davis was part of a family, though not one based on biology or heredity. These, the modes of inclusion and embrace produced in these scenes of domesticity and belonging constituted him as a member in multiple sites of everyday life, in the workplace, in the pub, in the garden, and in the parlor. Yet a profound fugitivity can also be found in these photographs of intimate gatherings on the couch or at the pub, images that depict friendship 
through the physical intimacy they display, through arms clapped on shoulders, heads resting on shoulders, heads touching other heads, friends huddling together shoulder to soldier. It is not merely the continuity or consistency of the group context in which Davis is pictured through which their affects register. It's a touch of physical contact that connects them, a touch of domestic intimacy that figures relation as more than just knowledge or recognition, more than randomly being assembled in a group, more than merely companionship. The intimate touches captured in these images place Davis in the midst of his social milieu among friends, colleagues, and family who embraced him as adopted kin in ways that both sheltered him from and exposed him to a regime that sought his exclusion from their midst. Davis appears both popular and deeply embedded in the social life of his locale and perpetually surrounded by friends. These were not obligatory family portraits, they are snapshots thoughtful yet spontaneous images that capture moments of conviviality for future enjoyment. At least one, though most likely multiple photographers, desired to capture his image, to keep and to hold it over and again. But what's right and what's wrong about the conviviality pictured in this image? Paradoxically, the presence of the soldier um, the soldier in the image both confirms and interrupts the continuity of the image's festivity. His appearance pairs with Harry's consistent visibility as the focal point in these image, images of trios and close-knit friends that underlines the power of this set. While they share beer, a sunny afternoon, and conversation, the uniform in the midst of these civilians distinguishes their lives from his. One member of this group is visibly conscripted to protecting and upholding the rule of the state, and that state is a regime founded on a doctrine of racial purity and productivity, and dedicated to Aryan supremacy and domination, which returns us to the image and its effects. The tenderness, joy, and connection that structures Davis's placement in the context of each of these groups of individuals with whom he poses, enunciates relationships of intimacy that seem unwavering throughout this archive. They are images that touch us quite literally because of, and in fact through, the physical touches they depict and the effective relations they solicit. The touch of head to head, head to shoulder, arm to shoulder, shoulder to chest. The forms of stillness these images display are stilled moments of embrace that capture the intimacy of adopted kinship. It's an embrace that signifies visually in the multiple forms of embrace these photographs image and through what those physical embraces represent. Inclusion, exception, I'm sorry, acceptance, protection at a time when the opposite was supposed to be the case. Yet it is in the same, in the seamlessness of these images depiction of touch, the touch of intimate relation and the embrace of adopted kinship that their fugitivity also resides. For the embrace that sustains their relationship was the embrace of an outsider transformed into kin. These images materialize the presence of a racial other as the ultimate adopted relation, shielded in plain view by friends, neighbors, and coworkers who adopted him as kin and a chosen relation and buffered scrutiny and potential injury by the state through his inclusion in the tightly woven fabric of a community. Thank you. You've heard a marvelous blend of images and narrative. Uh, in 10 minutes, we're supposed to have a coffee break. Oh, we can go an extra 15. But I think it's more important to discuss the papers. Mm -hmm. Questions? Wait for the microphone. Microphones. It's coming. Here's the microphone. Okay. I don't think it's on. I don't know if I missed something in the beginning of Ms. Kemp's talk. Could you, could you speak up? Yes, I don't know if I missed something in the beginning of your talk, Ms. Kemp, but could you tell us where you got the photographs? Um, 
these particular photographs uh, were, um, of Harry Davis and the Ngandos were part of a very controversial exhibit in Köln, um, uh, Sonderkennzeichen Niger. Uh, okay. um, and they were collected by archi an archivist and researcher named Peter Martin, um, who, who the controversy was about the way in which these images were displayed and the narrative that was constructed in relationship to them and the way in which the exhibition itself um, in many ways created a narrative of victimhood um, for black German subjects that essentially what you got, the takeaway of it was the victim, the sort of systematic victimization of black Germans. And he was kind enough to allow me to use, look at, and to um, duplicate um, some of these, some of the images. And what I found in looking at them outside of the context of the exhibit is that they tell, they tell not a different story than he was trying to tell because when I interviewed him, because he was one of the last people to actually talk to many of the people, many of these family members who died since then. Um, his take on it was, you know, these photographs really do show the place of black Germans in families and in different social contexts. And so I felt that it was really important to engage them not as objects that document something, but as precious possessions that are about um, what does it mean to be part of a family and to actually think about what does it mean? What basically does it mean to collect your own photos, to make your photos of a, to make photos of a family in a particular moment in time when the visibility of blackness was actually a danger? Um, so that's a long-winded answer to your question. I'm sorry. <laughs> right behind you. Also, um, I was, it was a wonderful presentation. These photos play with your emotions in so many ways, and I was. I'm struck by how many ways I felt like you needed to, I sort of wish that I can now go back to the multiple photographs that had already exist and find uh, black German there. And of course, these are in, in that regard sort of teasing you and then leaving you disappointed. But my question to you, uh, I actually very much like your restrained reading of it. Nonetheless, are, are there sort of broader ways in which we can even modestly rethink some complexities of race in the Third Reich through these photos, or do we, is it better to leave them as sort of, as you call, you know, sort of as, as these beautiful snapshots into the possibilities of integration, or what can we sort of do with them a little bit more to push, if we want to, to push our understanding of this period further? Or are they just plain exceptions, and that's it? We leave it at that. Well, I, th I want to open that up to these two very, very knowledgeable women, um, because the thing that unites our presentations is that we're talking through photos and talking to photos. And that I think one of the sort of privileges of being on this panel is to actually be able to have this not be seen as exceptional. <laughs> that your, the images of your families um, are part of the same history. And so I do not think that they are exceptional. And I think that the complexity of them is the complexity of viewing all three of these, all four of these family, sets of family photographs of black Germans together. So my initial, um, my initial motivation um, for starting to write about family photographs was really that I had no idea how to write about family photographs. <laughs> I had no idea how to write about photographs. But photographs move me, and they touch me, and they solicit all sorts of emotional responses, and they're not even members of my family. And so I needed to be accountable to the emotions and the, the intensity of what photographs of black families in Germany do to me. And then to think about, to try and understand what it must have meant for them to take them. And then not just to take them, to keep them and to give them, 
to you or to you know, give them, because that's why you take a photograph, is you take it to give a piece of you to somebody else or to keep a piece of somebody, right, with you. And so that's, the, that's for me, the, the connection in so many ways, and I really wanna hear what you guys think about the photographs and because your writing and your memories, you're dealing with it through your own memories. And so that emotion and that connection and what it represents to both have those photographs and to be able to think about them as a connection to these stories is really powerful to me. I, um I feel similarly about the power of the photograph, and um, I've experienced it in several different ways. I remember, uh, Tina, when you were at Stanford and you showed a different set mm. of photographs of, of black Germans, it just becomes another vehicle that fosters connection and then expression mm -hmm. that, you know, kind of demarcates time in a different way. Um, so the connections that we have uh, to our family's present day and then through these photographs, um, they just really flesh out and enhance what the past means. Mm -hmm. and, and as you said, when you share a photograph, when I share a photograph with someone within my family, it's very different from the experience of sharing it with someone who has no other connection, but then it kind of generates a connection mm. and generates a way to discuss other things and then fully, you know, complicate our experience together. For me, photography is really connecting with the past, giving me a sense of my present. I don't know what it does for the future, but I've always believed that for the dead, and most of the people in, this photo, in these photographs, for me, have passed away, is that you really don't die until the last person who remembers you dies, unless you have photographs or stories. So to me, the writing down of these stories, the preservation of these photographs, will continue that history when I'm gone and that they won't really die and that that period of time won't really end because it goes on. So for me, it's really historical. Now some of the stories, some of the, the, the pictures, one or two in particular, I don't know how to connect. I, it, one might be um, the half-brother of my mother. So having heard your story about making up stories to sort of, not making up stories, but, but using your imagination to sort of fill in the blanks, um, for some of the stories that have already passed, I, in my, in my imagination, create a story that ties it all together. But it's really about memory and past and history and family and keeping the links, whatever they are, whether they're bad, good, but just to, to have something to pass on when I'm no longer there to further the memory of these people so that when I'm no longer there, they still live. That's how I feel about stories. That's how I feel about photography. It's very personal. Question? Um, thank you. Uh, I mean, you're right. It's, it's an incredible set also of stories to make us think. And I was struck, um, Tina, by your use of the phrase recalcitrant normalcy, mm -hmm. um, which is a wonderful phrase, and I think is another thing that links the pictures, yeah. um, the moments at which photographs are taken. But I'm also struck by 
and I'm not quite sure how to put the question, what the question is. The, the questions that are raised about us as human beings, that recalcitrant normalcy that we all have and that we all strategically is our everyday life when a number of us are in the condition of migrants, exiles, diasporic people. And yet at the same time, particularly as all three of these are about that period of the war, recalcitrant normalcy under specific and different legal regimes. Mm. You were both talking about mothers who went from one space to another and to a United States which had a legal regime that was not that of the Third Reich, but that had different codes, both overt and covert. Um, and so I'm not quite sure what the question is, except for, in my mind, the meaning of these stories in the face of, in that normalcy, negotiating all of what it means to, you know, go to school and be a regular kid or take you to be a normal mother and take your children to school under all of these unspoken, silent, and yet, as you all point out, hyper-visible <coughs> moments of um, conditions of being. Um, oh, that was deep, that was dense. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, one of the things that I was trying to say with this concept of stasis and homeostasis is that what I'm struck by is, you know, in diaspora studies, we're, so, we're very concerned about the migration of, you know, frequently. It's about the migration from one place to the next and what happens when you move from one place to the next and a new place. And I'm actually always more interested in what happens when people who move stay put, decide where they're going to be and, and make your home and make a family there. And I'm also struck by how black folks can make normalcy under the worst circumstances. <laughs> and so what I'm struck by in, in all, in your stories as well as in these photographs is the way in which you can actually sort of see all around, there's so much crazy that they're having to negotiate, but these families figure out a way, each of, each of you figure out a way to be and to have your normalcy in the midst of massive craziness and, up, and upheaval. Um, and that's, to me, the important thing about these photographs, is these photographs are these places where people look good, right? They look, you know, they look turned out. And, you know, when everything around them may have been horrible. Um, and that's what we want to be able to, to give to someone else, is we want to be able to, you know, whatever's happening, I'm going to look good for this photograph that I'm going to send to so-and-so. <laughs> Put on your Sunday clothes. Right, right, yeah. right. Yeah, if I could just add something to that, you know, um, I, I, just, I didn't show the set of photographs from my parents for um, what I call Dancing with the Stars. You know, they, my dad bought her these ball gowns from Denmark, and they would compete within the army. They had these dancing competitions, <laughs> you know, for the foxtrot and all these other dances. And, those are great photographs too, you know. And um, but what strikes me is this idea of moving from one, you know, racial state to another racial right. state and having to, to negotiate this or learn new coding. Um, is that even within the states, you know, there are different codes for each locale, and so you know, any type of movement requires this negotiation, but I think it also exposes the instability and the fluidity of these regimes mm -hmm. um, at the same time. You know, it's, it's paradoxical. So the, the looking good doesn't necessarily seem like such a paradox when you realize that they're, they're on this cusp of, of just being in spite of the racial state. And um, that's some of the things that, that I also get from the photographs. I, I think I'd like to connect to the last two questions and to maybe the last three answers and just maybe see if we can think about this some more. Um, 
one question that still puzzles me enormously is either what is the nature of German racism or what is the nature of German whiteness? And especially Tina's pictures would be impossible in the US at the same time, um, except possibly in the Communist Party. You, you would not see a racially mixed group like that in public. Um, so what does that tell us about Germany? And not about the racial state so much as about um, the recalcitrant normalcy. We also don't see these people at all as resistors. I mean, they're really just normal people. So can we extrapolate anything about how normal, you know, not national socialist ideologues, but normal people, how did they think about black-white racism from 1933 to 1945, and to what degree does that, does something like that continue over or not continue over? What were these young women who fell in love with black, black GIs thinking? Um, you know, as somebody who was born in 1943 and was a child um, still under segregation, though in the North, you know, there were, you know, enormous racial taboos about even touching a black man as I was growing up. So did these young German women, I mean, what were they thinking? So I'm wondering what we could, if we can conclude anything. My mother used to say that she, she had some cousins who had emigrated, or their, her uncles had emigrated to the United States. Um, in the 1900s. And so at the end of the war, this American, white American lieutenant um, came to the farm to find his um, German cousins. And um, what she said was that the white American soldiers were no different in many ways than the German Nazi soldiers. They were cold, they were arrogant, they spat on the German citizens. Um, you had to cross the street if they were walking. But she said the black soldiers, and they didn't laugh, they, she said the black soldiers gave gifts, smiled, were nice, how could you, if you were a young girl, and one of the pictures showed the fraternization of the black soldier with white Germans as well. They weren't just women. Because the black soldiers went over there, and despite all the Nazi propaganda, they treated these people with dignity and kindness and um, there was something special about the black occupying forces that you didn't necessarily see from the white forces. The lack of arrogance, um, just that swagger, that fun, that consideration for just basic humanity that was not afforded them in their own country. They were superior in that respect. Maybe some of those young women actually saw that, felt that, and went against the norms of what their parents had taught them. If I could add just a couple of things to that also. Um, you know, I, I always want to complicate the experience of, of groups and, um, you know, so it's difficult to just talk about these monolithic groups, <laughs> African-American soldiers, Germans, white, but uh, I, I think the African-American soldiers had a, a, you know, a multiplicity of behaviors and attitudes that they brought with them also to Germany. And 
Um, so two things to your, your question, uh, Sarah. One, um, you know, the coding here in the United States and, and what's normal and what's taboo, I think that that is really operating on, at one level and that human relations are happening above, beyond, and in between all of those codes. And the, the evidence is our kind of multi-colored, beautiful grouping of people here. I, I mean, human beings were connecting regardless of those codes. So it's just a, a matter of who was doing it and when and, and what the surface story was and, and whether it wasn't and, and all these things that happened in private and what was allowable in public, I, I think that's very complex. And I don't think those codes necessarily prevented the um, interactions that you might see heightened at a time of war when in, during war and during occupation different things are revealed and kind of, you know, the turmoil things are, are put on the surface that you don't see at a, at a time of peace. And I think that's one of the things happening in a war zone or after a war is the visibility of power relations become turned upside down and certain things become acceptable um, under codes of law under, you know, power rules. And, you know, not all of these relations were beautiful love affairs. You know, there is the brutality and the spoils of war in any war zone that, that also go beyond race. So I'm, I'm just trying to say these stories don't happen in a vacuum either, but I think in a war zone, there's more mm -hmm. visibility to mm -hmm. brutal power structures and to the exceptions that people <coughs> make under heightened conditions of survival that you don't necessarily see in a, a kind of calm re regime. I'm just kind yeah. of throwing that in, into the We can accept one more question, but the next session begins at 4. It's 20 of 4 now. Okay. Uh, wait for the microphone. Well, well here, Peggy has down. the microphone and then your comment. Okay. Yeah. Oh, well, it is always hard to follow Sarah after, <laughs> after her question, so I, I got um, numerous other things in, in, in mind um, before my own question. Uh, well, it's, it's, it's um, too bad that Maria Hoon is not here, who could um, actually contribute to the last um, couple of questions here, and, uh, but I'm very thankful for um, uh, your statement right now, um, Vera, to... Um, because it reminds me of um, basically us on the other side uh, where I felt like, uh, well, a lot of our mothers basically not being together with uh, uh, our fathers, um, they spend most of their life trying to get back into whiteness with their children on their sides. And this is also a part of this history where we start now to, to enter a new angle. And um, Tina, whoever bullied you in the, into this panel, it makes perfectly sense. Because I think we are now approaching an angle where we shifting from uh, uh, the formation of uh, minority identity or what it means to have the hyphenated identity towards not just normalcy but the notion of participation. And I think that is something which is a crucial part of what might always add to some kind of misunderstanding between you know, us from Germany and us here from the US. Um, because we grew up with a different narrative of this participation. Um, most of these this, uh, uh, photographs is basically also can be found in my uh, uh, photo albums as well. And um, the grandfather in the uh, uh, um, Wehrmacht uh, uniform or the uncle and the stories about both, you know, ending up in the concentration camps and basically uh, building up a concentration camp. So I wonder if it's not that we not only need to emphasize that more, that we do have um, a history of participation and, and um, what are we doing with that? So actually, while you were all talking, I, I was more interested, not so much in the black part of the history, um, as cruel as that might sound, um, because that's what we do all the time and that is also something which, on a very superficial way, um, is something where we share 
uh, uh, an identity, but we also share another part of a history where we usually, growing up in Germany, um, try to run away from very <laughs> quickly and very hard, because that is what, what basically was the narrative uh, on our kitchen tables. So about uh, national socialism and very often um, not very reflected and not very um, well aufgearbeitet, worked through um, uh, 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 history. So, um, and then of course, then we, we, we get in a dialogue and what we get is, oh uh, yeah, I need to find my, my German heritage and so I think we need to clarify what kind of German heritage this is and how do we deal from both sides of the ocean with this um, inheritance what we have of this participation, the history of participation. I'm not sure if I'm making pretty much sense. Uh, this is really what just hit me where I thought, yeah, this is, um, you know, what are we doing with our part and not, of course, n not in, in, the, in the sense of guilt or, or some kind of responsibility, but which is also inscribed in us and which really complicates this notion of German is what we are looking for, um, where we very often feel like coming from Germany, oh, this is really annoying, I don't really want to be bothered with Germanists, and on the other side, you're looking for something else. Any response from the panel? I was just looking for, as I put it, the good, the bad, and the ugly. I just wanted to know. I didn't want to filter through history. I just wanted to know what part my family played. It was more of I don't want someone to filter it through. For some of my relatives, they didn't really want to talk about it. You know, my, my aunt's stories on the Russian front, she, I just really had to drag things out of her. She just didn't want to know, but I wanted to know. I wanted to know what, my, what role, if any, my family had. I didn't care whether it was good, bad, or ugly. I wanted to know. I didn't want to be a filterer and just wear Sunday clothing and just show the good side of our family. I wanted to know all aspects, the gritty side, both the black and the white. I didn't just go that, that summer to visit my German side. I also, I, I found a job with the German government and worked for AGFA. I wanted to really work in Germany and see what it was like. It's very different. And then I came back to Philadelphia to see my dad's side. So I only gave you the German side. I really wanted to know what both of them did. Again, the good, the bad, the ugly. For me, it was closure. It was a rite of passage. I had to do it, and then I moved on. So I didn't want to filter through that German and only see the glossy stuff. I'll, I'll just add that, um, you know, I'm always wanting to complicate things. But um, where I grew <laughs> up in, um, in New York, actually, I was within a, um, a Jewish educational system. And at a very young age, um, third, fourth grade, we were shown films of the Holocaust and the camps and what had happened in Germany with those, you know, big, fat, ugly Germans. And, you know, there was another white girl, German girl in my class, and we used to just bond together over that. Like, She's talking about our mothers, you know? <laughs> and like, what is wrong with this picture? But, you know, it was like, you were confronted in that environment with Germanness. What does it mean? It's not the little uh, Bavarian clocks and things, you know? <laughs> you know like, um, and, and so I, I just, you know, my siblings didn't, but I, I took off on that uh, quite early. And, and the confrontation with my mother was, was very much about who she was and what she had done and, and, and what it meant. And, and, and what I found was that, you know, there was a, a big wall between us until I grew up and, and actually learned German and started going to Germany and started seeing her as a young woman from Hamburg and not just my mother, that the communication started and she started sharing stories and they were hard stories to hear. But, um, you know, that's, that's how we heal. That's part of my writing I talk about um, uh, 
healing with the perpetrator, which I talk about in other venues. So I, I just, again, you know, these stories are important to, to tell. And, um, and Peggy, what you're saying is I, I think that the stories over here for African Germans, black Germans, African Americans who have Germanness in them is, is different from the story of, of black Germans in Germany, but they're not necessarily, they're, they're millions of stories and, and yeah. some of them, and I think they're not comparable in terms of trauma and difficulty and, um, and nuance. My, is this on? Oh yeah, there. Um, my comment was actually a response to the previous question, but it, it, that's a great segue to it because um, my father was in Germany before the war in 29 to 32, and what he told us is that when he would walk down the street, people would turn and say, ah, die Schwarze, sie schön. And to me that says that what is exotic is attractive, what, whatever the culture, what is different and, is, and exotic is attractive to many people. And to his, his first German wife, obviously it was, to, to my mother who was his wife here, it was, she was a Connecticut Yankee. And so I think that's somewhat universal. We now take a break, 10 minutes. Next session begins at 4. Thank our panelists.